For those of you who are expecting a sermon on the Battle of the Armageddon of Armageddon today, I'm sorry, I'll have to wait till next week. Lord, if the Lord tarries. What's been on my heart this week as we've been pondering today has been the world that we live in today. And as I said earlier, we have been chosen by God to live in such a time as this. And what are we going to do about it? What are we gonna, how are we going to respond? How are we going to live? How are we going to teach? How are we going to preach in such a time as this? A couple of points I want to make, and then I'll let you go home. We live in a spiritual battle that's been going since before this world was formed. Satan was tossed out of heaven with a third of the angels because of his pride, because of his rebellion. And since man was formed, Adam and Eve were created. This world has been attacked by Satan. It's interesting to me as we study the scriptures how Satan has declared war on anything that God has ordained. The three biggies in the Bible to me are, are marriage, our marriage, the church, and family. Have you noticed a war on families in this day and age? Unbelievable. Believable, it's happening, but unbelievable. Under attack. You know, Satan, back in Isaiah chapter 14, verse 12 to 14, and I've shared this with our folks before. Satan, there's, his pride was just overwhelming. He said five times, I will, I will, I will, I will. When he got to the fifth one, I will be like the most high. And he has counterfeited God from the beginning of, of creation. And so everything that he does is a, is a counterfeit. He's under attack. He's, uh, these institutions that God ordained have been severely under, under attack by him and his demons. The spirit of the age, I like to call them, they hate our children, folks. They absolutely hate. They have, they have all through time. And I mentioned briefly, sacrificing to Moloch, these little babies. They turn their eyes away from God, God the uh, Jehovah God. And the crops were good, so they sacrificed their children. And they say that when those babies hit the fire, that they turn the music up so you wouldn't hear their screaming. That's what's going on. It's worse today. It's worse today. It breaks my heart. The medical profession, along with everybody else that's in leadership, are promoting the castration of our boys, the mutilation of our children. We walk through three years of, you can't go to the park, you can't go to school, you can't leave your home. They hate our kids. They absolutely hate our kids. And then we find out a couple of months ago that they knew that this wouldn't succeed before they promoted the jab. Interesting stuff. I'm not going there today. But they hate us. They hate our children. They don't just hate the kids. They don't just hate, they just don't, don't just hate the children. They hate anybody that was made in the image of God. That's mankind. The angels weren't made in the image of God. The, the, the birds and the animals, they weren't made in the image of God. But man was. And Satan took it upon himself. We see the consequences of what's going on today. And some of the statistics just blow my mind. The mental health issue has just gone off the charts. Why? The suicide rates. There's, te there's, there's communities in Canada now, they've stopped counting. That's how many suicides are going on. That's unheard of. Today it's happening. And all this other stuff. Divorce rates, over 50% in the church. Think about that. Think about that. And I can rant and rave about all this stuff, and it breaks my heart to stand up here and talk like this. 
but we have to see what's going on. It's so important that we're praying for these children and these families, each other. It's a spiritual warfare that's going on. And if you don't believe it, just stop and pay attention to what is going on. But this is what happens when God is thrown out. When the Israelites turn their backs on God, this is what happened. And we saw it here in Canada and the United States since 1960, threw God out of the schools, the education system. We've thrown God out of the public square. We've thrown God out of Parliament. We've thrown God out of the ju judicial system. The judicial system used to be blind. Not anymore. It's small b blind, but very political. Our judges. And the very sad thing, as I stand here before you as a pastor, we've thrown God out of a lot of our churches. And that just should make you weep. Not only do they... Do they throw God out? When God gets thrown out, other stuff comes in. Other stuff comes in. So the first step back in the, f well, I would say in the early 60s, 50s, 60s, 70s, for those of you who are around, the pulpits with some wonderful preachers, wonderful preachers, but suddenly we're not sure if this is really, really actually God's word. Yeah, it contains God's word, but Bruce, we, I don't think it's God's word. Hey, folks. This is his word. This is an inherent word. And we stand by this word, no matter what the consequences are, because I know they're going to come after us, because they're going to declare this as hate speech. And that will give them opportunity to come after the church in a bigger way than they are already. That's what got started, the questioning of whether it's God's word, and then people would fall for it. And then, well, you know, I don't really think Genesis is just one day, seven days. You know, you know, I don't think Daniel is really a book in itself. You know, and then, oh my goodness, Revelation. No, that can't be, there can't be anything literal there, Bruce. It's got to be all symbolic. Yeah. And that's the kind of stuff that started. And once you open the door to doubt, once you open the door to untruth, the slippery slope begins. And so this word isn't God's word to a lot of people. And so what happens ultimately? We listen to man. Man is our God. And we are our God ourselves. So Self-righteousness, the Bible calls it. So we do what we want to do when we want to do it. And I would say, folks, believers, be really careful with that. It's very easy in this comfortable world we live in to worship things that we shouldn't be worshiping. But my encouragement to you is this. Love these kids. Be patient with them. They're in a tough world. They're tough. It's a tough world for them. I thought it was tough when I had to meet Billy Black at the back of the school one day. That was tough. No, no. That's nothing. What's going on out there today? They're grooming our kids. And they hate them. They hate them. I can't leave, uh, leave you on a negative note here. I say, well, just leave them, Bruce. If you go to Joshua, I read two verses to you. Joshua 15 says, choose you this day whom you will serve, right? As for me and my house, we'll serve the Lord. Verse 24, the people said to Joshua, we will serve the Lord our God, and we will obey his voice. And what's really neat as a pastor is I study stuff like this and I look down in verse 31, you know what it says? Israel did serve the Lord. All the days of Joshua and all the days of the elders who followed Joshua. That's a big deal for Israel. They didn't usually serve God that long. But because of this man, who was absolutely committed to God Almighty. He said, serve him, and they did. And they even served him in the elders after Joshua, who survived Joshua until they died. And unfortunately, we get into the book of Judges after that, and it all changes again. However, 
the importance of good eldership, the importance of good leadership in each church is, is, is imperative. So thanks for coming today. We do love these kids, and we will love them, and we'll, in, we'll impart to them God's word. And I commit myself to that, and I know our teachers, we have wonderful teachers here, commit themselves to that as well. Give me five minutes. I'm going to turn over to Titus chapter 1. Titus chapter 1. I'm going to read verse 5 through verse 9. I'm going to say this first. God is blessing this church, this local church. In numbers, and I'm not really a numbers guy, but yes, the numbers are getting higher. We're being blessed by people responding to the Lord. We're being blessed by the folks here who want to want to be involved in God's work. We're blessed by our Cuban ministry. We're blessed by our Romanian ministry and certainly our Shine On ministry. We're, we're just blessed. And with blessing comes more challenges. And as we see a full house again today, We've got other challenges coming as far as that is concerned. We've doubled our size in the last two years. With that comes trouble, not trouble, more responsibility for those of us who are in leadership. And I'm not bemoaning that fact. I love being your pastor. The... Uh, we're going to increase our deacons board. We're going to try. You'll have to get voted on. In, in our congregation, we vote on deacons. We don't vote on elders. We vote to kick them out, but we don't vote to put them in. Elders appoint elders. And this morning, I want to, before our folks, appoint another elder amongst us. I'm going to read the qualifications of eldership. Very similar to deacons, except for one main thing. And this is Paul talking to Titus. Titus is a pastor. Titus, I want you to set an order where he remains and appoint elders in every city as I directed you. Namely, and here it is. If a man is above re reproach, the husband of one wife, and that means a one woman man, having children who believe, not accused of dissipation, or rebellion, for the overseer must be above reproach as God's steward, not self-willed, not quick-tempered, not addicted to wine, not pugnacious, not fond of sordid gain, but hospitable, loving what is good, sensible, just, devout, self-controlled. Verse 9 says this, holding fast the faithful word which is in accordance with the teaching, this word, so that he will be able to both exhort, that means build up, in sound doctrine and to refute those who contradict. That's important. For there are many rebellious men, empty talkers, deceivers, especially those of the circumcision. And so this morning, I want James McGregor to come up before you. James, where are you? Oh, it's the back. <laughs> and for our folks, we have a man here that meets all these qualifications, a wonderful teacher. He doesn't, and he's very humble. That wasn't in one of those, by the way. And so I want to present to you, I guess I'm an elder too, James McGregor as an elder here at Kenmount Baptist church and I want to close in prayer now and I want you to welcome him but I want you to meet the folks after as well and I think we got some goodies in the hall of course it's Baptist church we'll have some goodies in the hall father thank you thank you for this day thank you for this time thank you for these folks thank you for the faithfulness of the local body of believers here I want to thank you for James, and I want to thank you for the fact that he will stand as an elder here. 
taking on some of the responsibilities as we continue to trust you, as we continue to seek to honor you in everything we do, in our teaching, in our preaching, in our lives, our very lives. Bless him, Father. Bless the folks. But most of all, Father, I want to thank you for the Lord Jesus Christ. And we realize, Father, that none of this, none of this would be pertinent if he hadn't died on the cross for each one of them. It's only because of the blood of Jesus Christ that we're redeemed, we're bought back, that we're declared righteous, that we're forgiven. It's only because of his blood. And we commit ourselves as elders, as deacons, as folks, to these children, to this work here. And we thank you from the bottom of our hearts. And I thank you for Christ's sake. Amen. Let's sing one more song. Can we sing one more song? Changing makes the triumph sure. Joyfully enlisting by thy grace divine, we are on the Lord's side. Savior, we are thine. Traditionally, here we started, I got myself in trouble. We, get, we started at the end of the service to do a benediction. So I've memorized about 45 of them. Today I'd like to do this one. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of the Father and the fellowship, the communion of the Holy Spirit rest and abide on all those who love the Savior now and until he comes back. And he is coming back again, folks. Until he comes back again. For Christ's sake. Amen. God bless you. Mm -hmm.